Everyone, welcome welcome back to episode 20 of the Redesign Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Rithvich Gautam, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Tim. Uh, really excited because uh, today we have with us uh, Michaela Mora. Um, we're, we're really, really excited to talk to her because I think this is a great person to have on for the finale. Uh, she, she's she been a staunch advocate for uh, sort of a more more cohesion between UX research and market research, and I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. Uh, so, Michaela, welcome on the show. And uh, my guests always do a better job of introducing themselves than I do. So, uh, why don't you tell tell the audience a little bit about about yourself and uh, how you got to where, where where you are right now? Well, thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity. Great. Um, my name is Michela Mora, and I have been a researcher all my career. I've been in the industry for 20 plus. I'm dating myself here, but I have been working at the intersection of market research and UX research before UX was a thing. And I, I am a formally trained researcher. Uh, I have a master's in market research another one in marketing, PR and advertising, and another one in psychology. So I have become through this career, through education and practice, I have worked on both the client side, what we call as a corporate researcher or internal research team, mm -hmm. and also on the agency side. And I have been running my own research agency, Relevant Insights now for 16 years, wow. working across many different types of industries, many different types of products and in, in connection with product development, customer experience, uh, segmentation, and mar marketing strategies. So all, all of that is connected. Although I know that in some parts of the industry, people want to silo them and segment them. But um, yeah. when all started, everything was connected, then came back, came separated. And now it seems to be going back to trying to connect the dots. But that's been I am a researcher. That's my that's my background. That's excellent. And and honestly, like that that like divergence and like reconvergence is something I'm very excited for us to get into. But before we start, let's uh let's just jump into a larger uh, like a broader idea. So like in, in your opinion, like uh, the, the core of this podcast is, hey, if we talk to enough intelligent people, will we learn something about the relationship between product experience and product design and growth, right? Like, so I, I would love to know, like, what is your, in your opinion, what is your relationship between product experience and the growth of a business? So product experience has always been a key driver of business growth. Mm -hmm. Once you make people aware of your product, and get them to try it, then companies start in the never ending process of retaining those customers. And product experience goes beyond the actual product use. Mm -hmm. So if you go to customer satisfaction research, we have always seen what is called the halo effect, which mm -hmm. is produced by salient experiences, which can be positive or negative at any customer touch point. It may be that the product performs as expected, or the customer service and support is excellent, or the pricing strategy may add higher perceived value, or the advertising or news about the products are aligned with the customer core values. All of this also can be associated with negative experiences and create a negative halo effect. So thinking that the product experience is reduced to actual product use is a mistake. In the customer's mind, mm -hmm. all these experiences with and in connection with using the product are connected. And customers don't think in channels. We want them to, but they don't. That and is... these experiences produce a halo effect about the product and the brand. The affects our willingness to mm -hmm. keep buying and to keep using the product. And all these elements that I mentioned should be part of the business strategy. That's how product experience is connected to business growth. And the more disconnected the product development is from marketing and other business functions, the harder it is to create a coherent strategy for business growth. So that's that's really interesting, right? Like the idea that, look, what you said about customers don't think in channels, right? Like we, we'd like them to, but what they don't. So even, even like a product experience is actually shaped by things 
beyond the actual usage of the product itself. And yeah. that's that I think as a notion is 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 really interesting. And I think that dovetails beautifully into the next like the next thing that I'm I'm curious about is so how do you if, if your product experience is more than what the actual usage of the product is, what is the how, what is the role of research, right, for for like understanding that product experience? Right? Like what how do you how do you how do you do research in a way to contribute to the business's growth goals or understand them when when in your thesis, like, you know, product experience is more so than just the usage of the product? I have to say that front, I am a researcher and I love research. For me, research is everything, but I have to be honest, research is just a means to an end right. for a business, right? The ultimate goal of research in the business environment is to guide decision making to achieve desired business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Business don't do research for the sake of research. Right. The creation of this, the product experiences touches many business areas from product development, operations, finance, sales, marketing. They should be connected to the business product and marketing strategy. And customers make trade-offs all the time. In all the, that touches all those different areas. And you need research to understand what those trade-offs are for your product, for your competitors, mm -hmm. and your product category. You need research to identify the drivers that make people impact you know, their decisions, what impact the customer experience. If you really want to attract customers and retain customers, you can really go beyond just the product use and explore the drivers in all those different areas that's going to affect your business. And that creates a conundrum for companies that have founders or product development teams that don't have a marketing or a business background because then they don't see the connection. And that's, that's the challenge we have had uh, now for a little while, right? And so that's that's kind of a, the, the role of research is to guide business decisions. And it's a tool that we have to use to guide to, to do that. Got it. Um, and then like so. We, but, you know, when you when we talk about the role of research broadly, now research is stratified into market research, UX research, CX research. Right. Yeah. Uh, how, is there. Like, is there a reason it's stratified this way? Uh, or is our understanding of, is it stratified and then we need to later on sort of put all of this stuff together? How do we, how do we actually relate each of these different strands, strands of research to the business goals, right? So let, let's go back to the, to the, to the origins. So let's, let's define UX, right? Mm. The term user experience was introduced in the early 90s by one of the founders, NNG, Don Norman. Everybody mm -hmm. in the US community know about him. Yep. When he was at Apple and he his team realized that the experience of using Apple computers was weak. This was in the time of physical products. Yeah. And the original definition, user experience was defined as the state of mind combining emotions and aptitudes that develop as a result of user interactions with products, with services, with customer support, and even marketing, which helps set up the expectations about the product and the services. However, over time, the scope of UX and UX research has become narrower, and many companies became, in many companies, it became a function to support digital products and the digital channels. And it got disconnected from marketing and from the business strategy at large. So I would ask, I would argue that if you keep the stratification and if you focus on one particular area, and, and I know probably have a lot of UXers in the audience and they want it to be UX be the whole thing. But if you have a very strong focus on UX disconnected from the company business and marketing strategies, you're probably going to have a negative impact on business growth. You may end up developing products which, for which there is no need in the market or at a cost that the company cannot afford or produce, right? Or with the pricing strategy, they may not match the customer expectations or the competitive landscape. Right. You may focus on features that don't support benefit, the, the benefits customers are looking for. 
and the product experience may not align with the marketing messages about the product or so on. You might be saying one thing and the product may be doing something else. And so UX research alone conducted in a silo, as it happens still in many companies, it's unlikely to have a positive impact in the business. It needs to be connected to the business strategy and combined with other types of market research. And that has been my message all the time, that you need to look out adjacent uh, areas where those things interact because it end up being it end up giving an incongruent view of the customer. You are focusing on one area and everything else is kind of ignored and you're not really making a dent in the business strategy and the business outcomes. And companies are not going to invest in UX research unless it helps their business. Yeah. No, I mean I I think I think that makes that makes a lot of sense. So can you can you you know as having having been in the research space for so long, worked with a bunch of companies for so long, can you share any specific examples or case studies where you've seen the direct impact of UX research on growth? Well, I have seen the impact of UX research on growth when combined again with other research initiatives. So I'm not talking about here of theories or hypotheses. That's been mm -hmm. part of my experience. And it's always been as part of a research plan to study different customer touch points along the customer journey. Mm -hmm. It's never only about digital interactions. Right. So in my previous life, as part of a research team, internal research team at Blockbuster Online, I know it feels like for, you know, that happened last century, uh, at Blockbuster Online and Match.com, I had the opportunity to be part of the launch of very successful products based on a lot of research that now you would separate into UX and market research before it was just research. Right. And Blockbuster, at Blockbuster, for example, we had a research plan to search for new market opportunities that started with qualitative research to explore unmet needs. I know this sometimes is called discovery research in right. the UX community. We call it exploratory research. Right. When we did this, it, it really fit into input needed to design a market segmentation study where a new product idea started to emerge from the insights, which became later, and I don't know if you guys remember, something called Blockbuster Total Access. We tested the product concept, the positioning, the pricing. We redesigned the website. We did many many rounds of usability testing. We had a usability a lab in-house and we have to redesign the envelope used to send videos by mail. That, yeah. that's not, I, I, I think like I heard the news that Netflix was doing that until just yeah. recently. And we tested promotions and email campaigns and put in place a customer satisfaction and brand tracker to monitor the experience and the market. And the first day, we went live. Mm -hmm. We got more than 20,000 people trying to subscribe. The website crashed, but we recovered quickly. So it was a good right. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we grew 1.5 million subscribers in nine months. Wow. So it felt like giving birth. Right. Me. That was my baby. <laughs> That's and awesome. We beat Netflix for the first time in a quarter. Uh -huh. And there, I know there's a lot of legends, you know, stories around why Blockbuster failed. That's a, that's probably a different podcast. Yeah, uh, of, that could be its own episode. That's its whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, so we, we beat them for the first time in a quarter. Our stock went up. And so I have seen UX research have a positive impact, but it has never been alone. It has to be part of a coordinated research plan designed for growth. Okay. So... Uh, I think I think you know the. I, what I would love to delve into is is this idea that look UX research alone is not enough. I think I think you know we all resonate with that, but oftentimes people kind of get tripped up around the stratification or like which team is supposed to do research, etc. Or even like what is the purview of UX research versus market research and so on and so forth. So, in what ways are market research and UX research the same? And in what ways are they different, right? And how do they fit together? And what things should be kept separate, in your opinion? 
I feel like a broken record talking about this, but let's try again. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say there are a lot of misconceptions about market research. Yeah. There is a very narrow view of market research in the UX community. And among those who are new to market research, if they don't start their career in market research agencies, which mm -hmm. span many different types of research, many really don't know what market research is. Those who don't know tend to associate it with surveys, quantitative research, or research supporting marketing, because that's many times the experience that they have when they go to a company and they see, if they see something, if they, there is a little group there, they probably kind of focus on a different, a particular type of market research, and they think that's all there is. But there's, there's so much more. Yeah. Market research is a multidisciplinary field that includes both qualitative, yes, we do qualitative research, and quantitative methodologies for both data collection and analysis. And the field is so big, so vast, uh -huh. that market researchers tend to specialize in certain type of research or methods. It's very hard to do everything and do it well. So prefer qualitative research. You will find many of them at the QRCA uh, conference. That's the Qualitative Research Consultant Association. Others prefer quantitative methods. You will find them a lot in the Insights Association, in data analytics and data science groups. By the way, these groups used to be called marketing science groups, which did a lot of the advanced statistical analysis. But they are all part of market research. Since they're all trying, at the end, what is the goal of market research? Gather data, insights, yep. to inform business decisions. And that's a unifying principle across all these fields that now look different just because you are in a particular method doesn't mean they are not connected. And for example, market research in the case compared to UX has been doing product research from need discovery to user testing for decades mm -hmm. in the physical world. The techniques are not much different from the techniques used by UX researchers, even if they work mostly in the digital channel. An example, all interviewing approaches from jobs to be done interviews, user interviews, usability testing, are all adaptations to what we call in-depth interviews, which are oral adaptations of written interviews, which is what? Surveys. So all those data collection methods stem from survey methodology. Okay. The different modes and variations. The research business and, uh, I mean, the, the business and research objective may vary from project to project. But behind the different terminologies, both groups are using the same techniques. Some will be qualitative, others will be quantitative, but there are not fundamental differences between the disciplines except in their focus, the problems they're trying to solve in a particular project, and terminology. And UXers love to borrow and relabel old stuff. Mm -hmm. I know some in the audience don't like to hear this, but I see UX research as another discipline of market research. It may have started in the, in the area of ergonomics and human factors. Right. The house has evolved and the application that is happening now really falls directly into the market research field. It is essentially product research in the digital channel, which I was doing before the term UX became the thing. Right. So UX research also exists to gather information to guide business decisions. Even right. I know there is some parts of the community that don't like to talk about money, it's like something dirty, but <laughs> You have to make money. You have to help the business to make money. Otherwise, they cannot pay for your they, they cannot pay your salary. Yeah. And so it is related to business development and customer experience, but ultimately it has to support business outcomes. So right now, obviously, we're at a point where in many organizations there's already an existing bifurcation between market research and UX research. And for those organizations that have already divided them up, what, what in your view, can they start doing to 
bring them back together and have a more holistic approach and overcome some of the uh, negatives of that divide that exists? What, what should organizations be doing? So this question has been asked frequently these days because companies are really realizing that it doesn't make any sense to have these groups working on their own and duplicating efforts and showing disconnect, disconnected insights. Uh, we have a, a whole session, a whole track on experience management at the Insights Association conference this year. And it was all about that. And we had a lot of companies bringing together that question. And in my experience, integrated teams in which all research disciplines are expected to work in complementary ways and connected to common business outcomes is the best approach to this. I have seen it in work. I have seen it work in practice. This is not theory. So to create a more holistic approach in practice requires hiring diverse people, not only in terms of different backgrounds and demographics, which is also needed, but also with different skill sets to facilitate insights, triangulation, and synergistic learning. Companies also need to create the structure. So you can say whatever, but then if everybody's landing a different group because of the company structure, it's not going to work. So right. you have to create the structure for this to work. Being in the same team, working on the same projects, even from different angles, having just simply team meetings sometimes are ways to make this integration possible. You have to kind of force it. You cannot, it has to come from the top. You cannot just let people, because everybody's concerned about their jobs. There's a lot of territorial fights. You yeah. do this, you do that, I'm better than you. And that's really that's not helping anybody. It has to come a mandate from the top and say, we're going to work together. We're going to find a structure that works for us in our organization, the type of problems we're facing, the product that we have, and find a way to get people working together and stop the fighting and the, the you know the division, which doesn't help. What? So as you as you're talking about this, I think that's that's like a great point. And as you're talking about this, something that uh, came into my mind is uh, this idea. I think now recently there's getting more traction of like a research repository, right? Uh, where where people are like, hey, like you know, you if you've done UX research, you put the videos, you know, the results from that in there. If you've run surveys, put the results from that. You know. It, customer interviews, all of this stuff, customer support interactions, you're putting, pooling all of this data into one place so that, and so that you can kind of get a cross discipline view. What is your view on research repositories and like uh, people that have tried to build them or like have, have you seen anyone succeed in building one? Um, yeah. This is, this, I think this is uh, one of those things where it's, it's necessary, but not enough. Right. right. You can have that there and nobody's looking at it. Right? Uh -huh. There's no system to uh, to do this. So you kind of still have to have de dedicated resources to socialize the results, to pay attention to, to this resource and trying to make it because people don't have time to go through all the data that is available if you do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Right. So I saw um, a couple of years ago, there was someone at another conference from Microsoft talking about their repository system. And they, they have this huge, they create their own proprietary system. And they still have to have a team synthesizing, sending a newsletters, summaries of research, having meetings. You have to actively force people to consume that information because they are in their jobs. They need to do things. They just need to, right. they, they, and you know, there's a lot of pressure with faster and there is a lot of pressures around that people really don't have time to consume all that. So you have a repository, but you still have to have the mechanism so people can really use it. It's not just because it's there, you're going to use it. And then there is the other issue is, if I am a person without not a lot of experience in research and I see this study, how am I going to consume that? How, wh why is it I need to be paying attention? So you still have to have some guidance into, you know, triangulating those insights with others. So the interaction, we want to all now outsource everything to technology, but we still need humans mm -hmm. in this process to make it work. And so that I know AI is now the whole thing, but yeah, please 
don't remove the humans because you're going to lose a lot in that process. Right. So, so in your expertise, so let's say um, I am, you know, I, uh, I'm the head of, head of insights at a company and I'm listening to this podcast. In your expertise, like what is your advice to me if I'm like, okay, how do I get my organization to improve my research practice and align UX and market research, right? Like what, what should I do? Because, hey, I've in, I'm frustrated. I've invested in the, in the repository deck, right? I'm trying to get people to do this, but like, you know, I have a repository. People are not using it regularly. Uh, how do I, like, what, what do I do in terms of setting up a practice, right? Like how do, how do I do that for my organization? So I think it, it, it First, talk to uh, at the top. <laughs> this is it. you need support from the top. Uh -huh. Research doesn't move in the organization unless you have research champions at the top. Okay, you have to have someone who is, and and you might be unlucky not having anybody who really understands what research is because that's kind of pre also common in many companies. That they, they, they understand you have to sell it. What is the benefit from them? that you have this system so people can really reuse. So you can position it in terms of we're going to save, uh, we're going to avoid duplicating efforts if we are able to really um, consume all this information that we're having. But one of the things that happens many times in that system, you need to first start creating a common terminology. So everybody agrees on how to pro to consume that information. A lot gets in translation because UX researchers and market researchers are using different terms for the same thing. So you have to create systems around it. Organizations should invest in research and education from members of the research team so that you have a schedule internal learning sessions to present the research conducted. So discuss not only the results, but also the methodologies, the approaches used. Allow for discussion of pros and cons so you can do it better. There's always room for improvement in many research projects because it might be, may have been curtailed by timing and budget or some, there's always limitations, there's always constraints. And the question is, how do we learn from it? So if you're gonna take that initiative as a head of research, you have to have a plan First, to make it valuable for the top, say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is are the resources. But you have to position it uh, from the money perspective. What is the organization right. going to win? How, how, how are they going to benefit if we do this process? And somebody told me, actually, in the CX space uh -huh. a long time ago, they said, well, if you're going to do, if you're going to make friends in the organization, get friends with the finance VP. Right. They are the ones who hold the money. Yeah. And so you go to them and say, what is your problem here that I can help you solve? Mm -hmm. And then when they start seeing, if you don't have a good champion of research at the top, they can support your efforts. You need to find the people with the money and help them understand the value of research. So when the recession comes and the next wave comes, they, you are not the first one out of the door. And you can see that this system that we put in place is really helping the business. You cannot never forget this is a means to an end and the business need to get something out of it. Otherwise, they're not going to invest in it. So you have to position, you have to sell it. It's a marketing process internally yeah. to be able to, to set up this process. I, I think there's this notion with, uh, at least with product, like, you know, from a product management standpoint, like this thing, idea of like pots to dollars, right? Like where you're like, hey, I'm going to, you know, build this product and here's how it's going to, actually influence the bottom line and i feel like that story is easier to tell when you're just talking about like building a product right um but how how do you tell that story with research where it's like hey we're gonna learn these things and it's gonna influence like we're hoping to learn these things or we're hoping to study these things and the insights is going to help us do x better which is going to result in why dollars, right? Like, how do you how do you tell that path to dollar story? If the point is, I'm trying to get like financial buy-in for the guys at the top, because you're absolutely right, right? Like, guys at the top are like, hey, how is this gonna make me money, right? Like, the 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 the, the their focus is very it, it's very simple. So how do you how do you tell that story from like, hey, doing research helps you get more money? Like, we we know this to be true, but how do you paint that picture for someone? Well, you start you start at the end. Okay. You start at the end asking, what are the decisions you're trying to make? 
what are the problems? And that's why I go back to what I said at the beginning. What is this, the business strategy? Mm-hmm. Where, is, where are you going? What yep. is the business outcome that you're trying to reach? Right? And sometimes researchers, depending on the experience they have, if they have business acumen or not, they might get stuck in their research question and they confuse it with the business question. There is a business problem and there's the research problem. And you need to be able to translate that. So you start with the business problem and say, usually what, what, is, what is the problem of the business? Business need to acquire customers, retain customers, essentially, you know, at a very, very high level. They have to make money to be able to at least survive yeah. Not thrive. Even nonprofit organizations need to manage their money to be able to keep going. Right? Correct. So you need to go to that core of what is the business goal and how you envision it going to that goal. Is it, are you looking for new market opportunities? Is it exploration, expansion? Is it penetration? So there's a lot of marketing questions around that. How are you going to go to market? Mm-hmm. So I can then go back and say, okay, to get there. This is the type of information you need to make those decisions. And those are the research questions. That's not the business question. Yeah. The business question is, I need to acquire customers or we have, we're losing customers and this is the problem that we have. We have a problem in this area. How do we solve that? And then we as researchers have to help the stakeholders to figure out, okay, what information do we need so to, for you to solve that business problem? And that the problem is that many times companies don't allocate time and money to go through problem audits and really go through, because it's painful. People don't want to think through it, and then they are in a rush. And, they, and I get many requests when clients, potential clients come and say, they say, we want to do research, we want to do focus groups, or we want to do a survey, we want to do usability testing. It's like, wait a minute, tell me what's the problem first, because I don't know if any of those methods are right. going to solve your problem. So and that happens internally too. People go immediately to what they know. Oh, I think we should be doing a survey. Or, oh, I think we should be doing usability. Or oh, I think we should be in focus groups. And nobody is really thinking through the problem. And many times when I start asking questions about the problem, the business problem, things change. They realize, like, oh, that's not the problem. Or we are here, we want to be here, but really our problem is still here. So we need to first answer this before we get here. And that type of conversation, that type of discussion needs to be happening internally between the stakeholders. And researchers can help guide that if they have experience. Sometimes they don't. So you kind of have to figure out who really have experience to guide that type of conversation because it's not about just research. It's about the business, understanding the business fundamentals. Right. And some business can allow for certain things, others don't. You know, there are regulations, there are the, competi- the competition has influence. There is a lot of things to consider. And so if you want to really get support from the, from, from the top, first understand the business. Mm-hmm. To be able to talk in those terms to the money people, the, the management team. And then go backwards and say, this is a problem how that, that translates. And that's why I was talking about research plan, because if you can prioritize the business problems, and they're gonna be strategic problems, it's gonna be tactical things. Not yeah. everything is big, and but you have to kind of find the strategy, the hierarchy of problems, and kind of allocate and say, okay, if we, got, if we solve this, this is the type of research that we need, and this is, and be very, very clear about the caveats. There's also this idea that, you know, Companies that never do research, when they decide to do one, they want to do everything one. And that's totally unrealistic and Mm -hmm. the formula for getting really bad data. But different problems require different type of research. But you have to know, you have to know research methodology to be able to understand the pros and cons because no research method is perfect. Uh, No uh, one method is going to give you everything you need to solve every type of business problem. I think what you're hitting upon is is pretty interesting, right? Like where, like people that don't have research expertise often just think of research methodologies as research, right? Like, and it's not it's not like research methodologies. You could just use, like, it's a toolkit. You could use it like any any combination of them. But do, what you use depends on what you're researching, what your research goals are, etc. But you, what you're saying is sometimes people because of a lack of experience or just because they're like. 
I guess we should be doing this thing called research. They just start picking up research methodologies and using them without without taking a beat to be like, hey, is this actually helping my research goal or not? Uh, well, we in market research we talk a lot about fit for purpose research. It's right. not any research, and unfortunately, many times in companies they are they do research not based on the problem, but they are based on whatever is available <laughs> internally. Or we already have a subscription to this tool. Now and now we have to use it. And now everything has to be gone. So it becomes a lay of the hammer. Everything goes to oh, usability testing or user testing or surveys or whatever it is, because now we're already committed to this without right. necessarily understanding, is this is the really? Is this the right methodology? I, you have no idea how many times I have requests for research. And when we start talking about, I kept saying, this is not the way you should be doing. This is not the right method. And sometimes they decide to do it anyway, not with me, because I, I also have some ethical considerations. I would not do research that I cannot defend. I cannot come back and tell you, oh, these are the insights when I know that that thing is not covering it. And right. so that's that's the challenge many times. The comp the if, particularly if you are an inexperienced researcher in the corporate corp corporate environment, it's very easy to you know kind of follow whatever management is telling you. And I have had I ha and, and I have been in those situations with some people in the management team. They want to play researcher. They want to come and say we should be doing it this way. This is the way I know I did that. And they don't listen. That they, they just have their own egos and hubris and all that and you know detecting what should be done and um, many times i have been in situations where when i was on the corporate side I, I, now i can say to the client okay i don't agree with that if you can find another vendor who can help you good luck i will not be doing that but when you are in a corporate environment it's very hard to to say no because if it comes from from the top as a mandate you have to go right but as you gain respect and credibility, sometimes you have to let them fail and you have to go. And I have been to uh, situations where I have to, I can tell them and say, can I tell you, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a disaster. And right. I can't, but I document everything and say, this is what's going to happen if you do it. This is what you're not going to get if you do it. And this is what you're going to get when you do it. And when that happens, when that materializes, sometimes it's just all they need to realize like, Okay, let's stop playing researchers. Let's let's bring someone who really knows what they're doing, and let's waste time and money in things that don't matter. Or are, I mean, if you do it right, you, you uh, how, how do they say you do it first? Uh, you you do it uh, right first, or do it twice later. And yeah. so that's the that's the challenge here. If you want to really long term save money and time, try to do it first, right first, uh, and, not, and not waste. Um, resources on things that don't matter and they're not going to give you anything that really is going to be uh, have a good impact. So the, the problem that you're describing here goes right back to where, where we're, we're at earlier in the conversation about the benefits of, of having a uh, kind of an integrated or holistic research team, because if you are trying to answer a business question and your research is divided up between very narrowly specialized teams, there's no one to answer the question, what's the best methodology to get at the heart of this question. If you give it to a quantitative focused market research team, they'll say, well, we do surveys and this, so so we're gonna run a survey. If you give it to a yeah. UX team that just does it, IDIs or, 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 or uh, usability testing or whatever it is, they're gonna run that. But if you have an integrated practice where there's a variety of skill sets and approaches all under one umbrella, they can better answer that question and then better execute on the research to answer it in the right yeah. way. And then you create a culture of questioning, right? Where you say, well, this is the problem. This is the business problem. You, you kind of refine it. You have it clear. I have been in many meetings where they start with the business problem and they realize that this is not it. We're not there yet. That's not exactly the most important at this time. So I keep asking back, what are you going to do with this? If I come back with this, what is that you're going to do? What is your level of tolerance for risk? Because so many times it's just tolerance for risk. It's like, are you okay with just making this big million dollar decision based on five people mm -hmm. <laughs> telling you yeah. they like this particular feature? 
Right. You know, there's all these caveats where you start mixing the methodology pros and cons with the business implications of that. But at the end, it's about the stakeholders really, if they are not in the business of research, they don't care. They just want to make sure that you know what you're doing, that it's done right, that you are backing up their claims because uh, they don't want to look bad in front of their bosses and making bad decisions. And when I was on the corporate side, which I always had a hybrid approach. I have my internal team, but I also use a lot of external resources, vendors, research partners that help me. But their main, their main focus was to make me look good. So I have to come back to my boss with this research plan when I'm doing this. And they allow me to kind of bounce ideas, do quality controls, because you get very insular. You get very, when you are just doing everything do I you know do it yourself internally not going anything from the outside it begins very narrow uh, you start doing only one type of research because that's what you know what you know teams are very small nowadays right mm -hmm. what do you have you have a couple of people unless you go to the CPG companies they tend to have bigger research teams in many tech companies they have just small teams and they have limited resources and they know maybe a couple of the methodologies you need to have larger diversity. If you can hire more, you need to partner with others that can really help you from the outside. They can really help you bounce ideas, find different approaches. Sometimes I bring, uh, I help them to create that research plan and they start realizing, okay, the moment you start having that team talking, you say, this is the problem we have to, okay, so if we have this, this is the type of research we need, but this is all the aspect that is not covered by that approach. That means we need a different skill set. Do we have it internally? It's okay to not have it, but you have to allow time and budget to be able to bring someone as an, a contractor or also a project basis that can help you to support, expand the capabilities. I know there's a big trend in our industry to bring everything in house. There is this idea they're going to save time and money doing that. But the problem is that nobody's thinking in terms of the opportunity cost. So, so let me let me actually jump in here and ask, like, you know, this idea of bringing everything in house. And I think uh, recently, uh, I, maybe it's a result of this like trend of people trying to bring things in house. Like, there's this growth of advocacy for democratizing UX research or democratizing research in general, right? And and we've asked this question to multiple people we've had on the podcast, and we've heard, you know, people that are strongly in favor for democratizing UX research, like everybody in the org should be plugged into research. There's some people that have been more weary about it, right? So what is your opinion on, like, democratization here? And, and like, if if someone says, "Hey, like I'm trying to I'm trying to like democratize research in my organization," what does that mean? Are you for it or against it? And then, like, if you're for it, like, what form does that take? And if you're against it, why? I think it has to do with the definition of what democracy <laughs> means in yeah. this context. So the idea of democratization has become problematic for many because it has become in some organizations a synonym of anarchy. Right. Okay. Yeah. Like everybody's doing it, even if they don't have the expertise, kind of. Democracies still need a government. Right. Rules, yeah. Processes and yeah. institutions to make it work. Right. If you remove that and the idea that everybody can do it, but no guidance, then you have an anarchy, which in the end is very inefficient and could be harmful for right. the goals of the organization. The organization is not a democracy. The organization has pretty clear goals. Right? right. And you need research expertise to guide that process. Yeah. So even if you have internal stakeholders doing certain things, they need guidance. They need someone. And I know there is this argument against like, oh, gatekeeping. Yeah, you need gatekeeping for certain things. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with gatekeeping if you really care, at least at a minimum quality level. Yeah. Right? I, 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 this is very much about garbage in, garbage out. And so you need clear business goals and outcomes to drive the research. The fact that everybody can have access to a research tool like, like yours, for example, doesn't mean they should do it if they don't understand research fundamentals and how they can infuse bias and errors in the process. And stakeholders without research training 
still can participate in this process. They can participate in the problem definition phase. They can help refine the research objectives and desired outcomes. They should look at the discussion guides, get feedback on the surveys, get feedback. They can observe the interviews, the data collection process. They should participate in the development of insights and the yeah. implementation plan of, the, of those insights. But they should not be designing the interview guys, the surveys, the studies the themselves, or growing the discussion or doing the data processing if they don't have research training. So that's how democratization can really have a negative impact on the value of the research because quality degrades pretty quickly in those scenarios. All right. and, and, and the management team notices. And at one point, the research becomes useless. Because one team finds something for whatever biases, the problems they have. Another team finds something else. You go to the management team in the meeting and say, you tell me one thing, this other team telling me what's so, so what's it? what is it? Mm. How do we go forward? And nobody can really answer that. And they'll become like, oh, we don't need research. It's like, this is useless. Nobody's, nobody really knows what they're doing. So it's like, let's not do anything. And so it, it, it really becomes use, useless in the hands of those who don't know what they're doing. That's, that's my main thing about, uh, I, I like the idea that all these tools allow many more participation, but the question is how? How do you participate in the democracy, right? You're still gonna have your elected officials. Yeah. <laughs> so you still can vote, yeah. but it doesn't mean that everybody's gonna do around, do whatever. Because right. that really it's not it's not going to help you in the long term. Right. Now, I I think I think that's a that's just a phenomenal answer, right? Like for because I, I, the the idea of like flattening an organization, I think I think there is truth to the fact that everyone stands to gain from the insights gained from research, right? But that doesn't mean everyone like democratizing research means maybe democratizing the outcome of research more so than the practice of research. The practice of research is is best left to researchers. Is is that is that am I understanding your thesis correctly? Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think there has been this. Um, confusion because the tools, many tools are very user friendly and you can set up a survey in a matter of minutes. You can yeah. go and, and, you know, program it because the inter and that kind of confused the fact that somebody still has to know how to write a survey before taking it to yeah. the tool. The tool is not going to do it for you. And I know there are no tools kind of sending packages of questions like this is a product. Mm -hmm. is a, if you want to do concept testing. Like templates the, and things, yeah. These are the four questions you need to ask. And then I have a hard problem with that because many times those type of questions are have a lot of biases and then the scales and all. Anyway, I'm not going to get into the methodological question because that would be another, again, another episode. But that discernment on what is good research has to come from someone who has studied and know methodology. Because again, no, pro, no, no method is perfect. You have to know the limitations of each. And you have to be honest with yourself. Like I am a specialist in this particular type of research. In this area, I really don't know as much. Let me bring someone in the team or from the outside, they can really help me think through how can we tackle this this issue with all the constraints, there's always constraints, the money, the time, access to sample, many things that, that, that are happening that someone who has not done research, and, we, and I have talked with those type of clients that they think there is, oh, that is easy. Like I do, for example, a lot of what is called conjoint analysis is a methodology for product optimization, configuration study. It's pretty advanced, it's very complex. And every time I get someone say, can you give me a price on a conjoint study? <laughs> can you give me the details? It's like, oh, it's going to be easy. We're going to have uh, three or four attributes. In the, in the, and when we start talking and I realize what is it they want to do with that, it's like it goes, it changes exponentially. It's like the complexity right. level kind of changes completely. And they don't realize that uh, because they don't know what is behind the wall in this yeah. type of uh, models. And so that you need to have that you don't have to hammer stakeholders with the methodology uh, conversations but you need to know to be able to say to the stakeholder no you're going to get this 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 
you're not going to get this, this, this. And they might not like it, but you kind of have to sell it internally so they know the limitations and to be able to find that holistic approach because no method is going to give you everything. Great. Okay, well, you know what? We're at time here, so let's go ahead and wrap up the episode. Michaela, it's been wonderful having you. Uh, you've uh, been sharing so much of your, your insight and experience. I know me and Rit have learned a ton from this. Yeah, uh, time flies. Like I, did, I, I was surprised that time was, we're at time. I was just listening. I was so dialed. Yeah, yeah we, we've been wanting to, to have this conversation about how the different modes of research go together and, and you know, knew, knew that you were a big proponent of, of the kind of integration that we, you know, have been – thinking about and curious about and, and wanting to learn more about and i'm sure uh many in the audience are too so thank you so much for for sharing with us uh, on this episode um and for our listeners thank you for tuning in as rit said earlier this is our season finale of season one of the podcast so we'll be taking a hiatus and we'll be back with season two uh before you know it uh so no episode next week but but stay tuned and and um we will be back with more great episodes for you thank you everyone and, and have a great weekend so long. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Last but not least. <laughs> yes, definitely. Bye. <laughs>